This morning, if you would, turn with me to Genesis chapter 22. Genesis 22, and I'll read to you out of it, Abraham and his faith and watching it grow. That's the study, essentially. But Genesis 22, now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham, and he said unto him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Well, then he said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering and one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, and he saddled his donkey, and he took two of his young men with him, and Isaac, his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering, and he rose, and he went to the place which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes, and he saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, Well, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, and he laid it upon Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and the knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and he said, My father. And he said, Well, here I am, my son. And he said, Well, look, the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Well, Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself a lamb for the burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there, and he placed the wood in order, and he bound Isaac, his son. He laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand, and he took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, and he said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad, nor do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we ask that as we look at it this morning that you would speak to us. Lord, that there would be something for every one of us here from the life of Abraham and his journey of faith. As we are in our journey somewhere, every one of us, we ask that you would help us and take us and lead us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you know, you and I, we are obviously born in a world that today is very, very far from God. We have a world today that people don't even know who created them. They don't even know if they believe in a God. And uh, much of us just think, well, they just evolved. And, and when there is no creator, then there is no identity. There is no purpose for existence. We just uh, are nothing. And when you don't know who made you, you obviously have no idea when have you succeeded. When have you fulfilled your created design? Uh, what's the, what is fulfillment in life? And so we're kind of left just to define our own success. And sadly, in our world today, it's much like the bumper sticker you see now and then that says, he who dies with the most toys wins. We almost just think, well, if I'm just doing a little bit better this year than I was last year, I must be, I must be doing better. But if I'm a little worse than I was last year, I must not be doing so well. But in a time like that, in a time like the, even today in which we're living, it, I think it's, it isn't so much of what a person has accumulated that defines them. It's what have they done with what they have. What is being done with it? What, what's the reason for it? And Abraham comes along like that and shows us it isn't so much of what I've accumulated, how I've offered it, what it means to me and before God. Another thing I think is wonderful to look at when we're looking at the book of Genesis, Genesis is to realize it's a foundational book in history, of course. It shows us, of course, the origin of creation in a physical life, but it also shows us essentially the origin and, uh, of spiritual life, what it is all about. Not only the fact that we were created, but the reason for which we were created. And Abraham is the first character that comes along where we really see his journey of faith. And we get a tremendous interpretation of what faith is all about, studying Abraham. And I think also to be able to look there when we, th when we look at Abraham to realize that the things that he learned, we, we think they're unique to him, but they're not. What Abraham actually had to learn in his life, every one of his descendants do, all of them. And the Bible tells us that by faith we're grafted into Abraham. In the most wonderful way, you look at him and you realize there that Abraham, he's our father, he's our mentor, He's our teacher. That when we look at, at his life and the life of so many other great characters in the Bible, we tend to think sometimes that they're unique uh, in their life or their journey, and they're not. 
They're really quite standard lessons that God wants to teach every one of us. We just tend to look at what they went through in the process and think, well, uh, that's pretty unique to me. But it really isn't in a sense. I think we have a tendency, we look at people like Abraham or David or Elijah or Moses, and we put them on a pedestal. We just think they're so unique, and we put them up there as kind of these great heroes of the faith, not realizing well, that's, that's quite legitimate to call them that, I suppose. But also, they're, they're patterns for all of our faith. They really are not that unique. What every one of them had to learn, so too do we. You know, when we get to heaven one day and realize we shall know even as we're known, to think of one day walking down the street, and there's David. David, you know, King David, and there he is. And there you are, and all of a sudden to me, I mean, I, I can't imagine the thought, uh, but essentially there, I mean, when we're there and we're sharing life with, with him, there he'll be. And I just imagine myself kind of walking down the street and all of a sudden, whatever the environment is like, you're David. Yes, King David, yes, yeah, I guess so. And uh, I would, I mean, I would have so much, I would just love to talk to him about it. But I know inevitably I'd want to get around to, I got to ask you something. I got to ask you something. Sure, what? Goliath. Goliath, what were you thinking? I mean, this, this man is a giant, nine and a half foot war machine. I mean, this man was an absolute animal beyond comprehension. And here you were a kid. And there you, you just stormed at him. You took him on, you destroyed him. What, 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 what were you thinking? You know, but I would imagine, it wouldn't surprise me not to have David look and say, well, let me ask you a question. Sure what? Are you telling me you never had a giant in your life? You never had something that you could never conquer on your own? It was way too big for you. You realized God had just put it in front of you and there was no way around it. You had to deal with it. Well, that's what it was for me. Just a, a giant. Certainly you had giants in your life, didn't you? Maybe your health, your home, your marriage, your family, your kids, your career, something. There, that it was just huge. Well, that's what Goliath was. No different for me than, than the same giants you had in your life. Or what it would be maybe to go down the street and there's, there's Elijah. And again with Elijah would come around, I got to ask you something. I was your what? 450 prophets of Baal. You challenged them. There you are all by yourself, surrounded by 450 men who wanted you dead. Who was just, and, and there you mocked their God. You actually made fun of them in every possible way so, you know, and, and choosing them up just to agitate them for them as they're calling upon their God to consume a sacrifice that he didn't. But there you, what, 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 you were surrounded, hundreds of them there surrounding you. Uh, what, what were you thinking? But I wouldn't surprise me to have Elijah say, well, let me ask you a question. Were you never surrounded by unbelief? Were you never in an environment in your home, your, your neighborhood, your job, your school, somewhere where there you just knew God put you there and you knew you had to speak up? You knew it is why you were there and, and, and you were surrounded. It seemed hopeless. You were outnumbered. But yet at the same time, there you were. There I was. I had to deal with it. I had to trust him. Same thing that you had to go through. Or, or there, Moses. You go, and there's Moses, Charlton Heston, uh, you know, or whatever. There's Moses. And we look at, and then the, inevitably, I, I got to ask you a question. Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the world, you go before him and you say, let my people go, all of them. Let them go. And he just boldly, and he's looking, who do you think you are? What are you doing? You know, there, and, 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 and yet there you stood, and you went before him. The courage, the faith. You know, but again, I, I, weren't you, didn't you ever have somebody so big, so powerful that there you knew you had to speak to him? You had to lay it out. Or Abraham. And you know, again, get to me, you know, get around with Abraham, and Abraham, I got to ask you a question. Sure, what? Isaac. Ah, your son Isaac. Yeah. What about him? Well, God comes to you and says, I want you to offer your son to me. How did you do that? What were you thinking? But I think, again, Abraham would say, well, let me ask you a question. Sure what? Did you have children? 
Did you have children on your own? Didn't you realize you could only go so far? You're a human being. You're quite limited. You could only put in so much into their life. But ultimately, you had to entirely offer your child to God. You would entirely surrender everything over you. That was it. You could, you, that, that's as far as you could go. He had to miraculously intervene. He had to take over. Surely you must have had a child in your life that you had to raise, and you went through this. In fact, it wouldn't surprise me to have Abraham say, besides, at the time, to tell you the truth, Isaac was a teenager. And what parent doesn't want to sacrifice a teenager now and then anyway, you know, or something? But on how, you know, the, the, how practical these lessons are as we're looking at. And we need to realize there are mentors. These are our teachers. These are our spiritual models that have gone before us that we're to look and realize just as they had theirs. We, you know, times in their life, so do we. We decide, I just want to go to heaven. I want it to be wonderful. I want to be happy, but I don't ever want a giant. I don't ever want an enemy. I don't ever want to be surrounded. Oh, please, God, spare me. Because says, oh, no. No, 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 no. I would never do that. I want you to grow up. I want your faith to be mature. I want your faith to overcome things that you could never deal with on your own. That's what it's all about. That is what, what are the experience of faith. And the wonderful thing is, is that we have uh, turned to, to Hebrews chapter 11. Keep your finger in Genesis. We'll get back there. But we have actually the story of Abraham's faith. You know, when we read there in Genesis 22, we're looking about 50 years into Abraham's personal journey with God. This had begun long before, you know, where uh, God came and says, I want you to sacrifice your child. This had been going on an interchange in a process of spiritual maturity and growth and many tests that Abraham had had before this one. But here, this was the culmination. This is where it kind of reached its high point in Genesis 22, but it began a long time before. And we're told about it in Hebrews chapter 11. But first, the definition of faith tells us in Hebrews 11.1, 1, it says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. In other words, the Bible tells us there that what faith is all about is that it's the substance of a world that's hoped for. You, you, you have this hope, this, this, there's another world, there's another life. It's the spiritual world, it's God's world. And, uh, and, and, and faith is something that it realizes that world exists and it's real. But it's also there, it says, and it's evidenced in, the, in, 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 in things that we do not see. In other words, he says, faith, when it's really happening, the substance of something hoped for out there, and it's evidence, I don't see it. Now, to understand that, back up a little bit here and just look at the way we all come into this world. Every one of us, when we come into the world, we're, giving five, we're given five senses, of which they're natural senses, and those natural senses help us navigate and mature and deal with the natural world in which we live. Sight, hearing, tasting, touching, smelling. And here through those gateways of information being drawn into the human soul, through those five processes, we learn, we grow, we mature, we achieve, and it can help us tremendously in the natural world, but it only functions in the natural world. It doesn't see the spiritual world, doesn't know anything about it, doesn't even operate within it. They're just functional roles that, we, that we're all given here, you know, of these, of these natural senses. But at the same time, all of those senses that are there in the natural world, they're also paralleled in the spiritual world. They all exist there too. And that is, for example, seeing. Seeing. Now, I've, I, I've, I've never actually seen the Lord and uh, like I see with my natural eye. But I can also tell you, oh, I have. I've seen the Lord. In fact, the Bible exhorts us all the way through, looking unto Jesus, the author and finish of our faith. I mean, uh, but we see Jesus, the Bible says. We're all the way through the Bible. Behold the Lord. We are told to, to look and to seek and to see him. Although I can tell you I've never actually physically seen him. I can be there unquestionably say, oh, I've seen his hand. I've seen his power. I've seen him work. I've seen transform lives, homes, marriages, families. And we do incredible things. Oh, I've seen the Lord. Without question, I've seen him. Hearing. I've, I've never heard an audible voice. Now, God spoke many times in the Bible audibly, and, and in many, many uh, you know, wonderful stories you hear, some of you maybe, if God spoke audibly to you. And, it's, uh, and it's, it's, I've never audibly myself heard the Lord speak, and uh, I would love to. Now, my wife disagrees with me. She thinks I've heard him all the time. 
only he uses her voice to do it. And the, uh, which that's actually very true. We laugh at that, but it's very true. Many, many times, 55 years of marriage, she has said things that I realized that's the Lord. That is so true. That is so good. I mean, and that's wonderful. I, so I can actually, yes, I've heard him. The Bible says, hear ye, hear ye, hear ye the word of the Lord. Jesus said, my sheep, they know me, they hear my voice. Oh, sometimes it's a still small voice behind us that says, this is the way, walk ye in it. But we are to hear him. And, uh, and hopefully, in fact, let me ask you a question. Why are you here today? Why are you here? Why do you come to church? Did you come just to hear somebody come in and give a chat? You know, something? Is it something? I mean, you, you turn on TV and watch a football game. You could watch news. You can watch politics. You can, watch, you can listen and hear and watch all sorts of things. But hopefully, I would like to think the reason that you came to church is that you hope God speaks to you. Lord, I, I've come. I want to hear you tell me something today. I want to hear you. I've got your word, and it's quick and alive, and it's powerful. I, I want to hear from you. I need it in the world in which I live. And then we want to hear him. We, the Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. The Bible says he's a sweet-smelling savor. I mean, here, we, we all come into the world with these natural senses, which do not work in the spiritual world, but they are paralleled in the spiritual world. And all that spiritual maturity is, all that growth is, walking in the Spirit, living in the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, led by the Spirit, all that they really are, essentially, is that when somebody is listening to and letting the higher, you know, senses lead their life. They're wanting to hear the Lord, see the Lord, fellowship with the Lord, taste Him. <laughs> He's the, the fragrance of their life. And they're listening to these as opposed to these. A carnal man is somebody still living to the carnal senses, being driven and controlled by them. A spiritual man is somebody that's being led by these. That's all maturity is in the Christian life. And hopefully through the processes of faith beginning to happen and grow within our life is we're listening less and less in these and more and more to these, wanting to see them grow within our life. And so here, essentially, though, when a person is venturing out in faith, all that is really happening is they're listening to the, 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 uh, the spiritual world more and more and to the natural world less and less. But the way it works, we're told by Abraham. Where did it start with Abraham? Now, like I said, here in Genesis 22, that section there, when we're reading this, of Abraham, God comes and asks him to, to offer his child to him. We're looking about 50 years into his journey. It didn't start there. God didn't come to Abraham and they met and said, by the way, I, I want your son. No, he wanted it. He wanted it. He was, he, someday that was going to be a topic. That was important to God, and we'll see why as we get into it. But the thing is, is that that is not how faith starts with anybody, and nor did it start with Abraham. We're looking at decades later in Abraham's life, but where it started, we're told down in Hebrews 11, verse 8. There it says, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out unto a place that he should after receive for an inheritance, he obeyed, and he went out not knowing whether he went. In other words, what is happening here is God begins to reveal himself to this man Abraham. And as he reveals to him, he tells him about another world, essentially. He comes and tells him there of an inheritance that he would give him if he obeyed him, if he trusted him, if he would step out in faith that he would receive this inheritance. We'll look at that more in detail as we get into it. But here is God revealed to him an, a, 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 an inheritance, a great blessing, an incredible blessing. But here as he's doing this to him, you know, sharing it with him, it was conditioned upon Abraham obeying, number one, and number two, going out not knowing whether he went. In other words, what is happening here is when somebody is beginning to, to operate within faith is that now all of these other senses that have led your life all along the way, so far, now God begins to intervene, reveal himself, tell, hey, there's another world. It's a spiritual world. It's an eternal world. It's my Father's house. It's heaven. It's a place there. I want, I want you to be with me. I want to take you there. I'll forgive your sins. I died on the cross. I'll forgive you of all your sins and everything. And somehow or another, God begins to reveal this truth to us. Somehow or another, we begin to realize, I want that. 
I want an eternal life. I want to be forgiven. I want this incredible, you know, blessing that you're just going to give it to me. You're just offering it to me. We don't know the Lord. To me, when I received Christ, I, I just, I, it was an incredible rumor, an unbelievable rumor almost, but it was enough there that that rumor of hearing I, my sins could be forgiven, I could go to heaven, I could have my name written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and Jesus would take me to be with him forever. I didn't know who Jesus was, really. I'd heard rumors. I'd seen, you know, I celebrated Christmas, Easter, you know, kind of as you do in the world, you know, or something. I, I heard he was, he was born, you know, or something. I hear he died and rose from the dead. I would heard that rumor, but I didn't know him. But here, when this is offered to me, somehow or another, I, there, you know, a journey began. It just starts this, the same way with, every, with everybody, same way with Abraham. There where God promised him something and it was enough where he realized, I'll go. I don't know where it is. And as it says, they're not knowing whether he went. Because what happens when somebody starts this, now all of these five senses that led Abraham so far for 75 years. He's 75 years old when this happens. For 75 years, all of these senses now, you know, God says, I'm going to give you another world, another thing. Now he goes out, but none of these senses could participate. None of them could help. None of them were any benefit. He went out not knowing whether he went. It's a whole new journey, a whole new world where faith is beginning to happen. It's beginning to take root. He is now going out not knowing whether he went. And now these senses are humiliated. And they're angry. And they mock oftentimes. You know, they, what, what do you think you're doing? What do you do? You're crazy. Maybe some of you, when you got saved, you received Christ. You go home and tell, hey, I'm going to follow in the Lord. I give my life to Jesus. <laughs> you know, they what? Yeah, yes, I'm going to follow him. Where are you going? I don't know. Oh, really? Now, I'll see, you know, it's just, you, you're just going out, not knowing where you're going yet. You have no idea. No, not yet. No, nobody going. You're crazy. You're, abs you're, you're absolutely, you're, you're insane. You, what, what's happened to you? You on drugs? You know, or what, you know, you got the wrong friends or, you, you know, you, you, those church people around you, you man, you got to get away from it, whatever else. But here the thing is, is that it's the same for everybody that here when somebody goes out, these senses can't help and they're angry. Haven't we led you your entire life? We were there with you the day you were born. We told you how to live and how to function. We've led you all the way. And hopefully, if we got a brain in us at all, we can say, yes, that's true. And you led me into nothing but trouble. You can't hold a relationship together. Oh, you can make promises. You can say you're going to try. You can say you're going to be better. And all this other junk, but you never you don't provide the goods. Look at me. My life's a mess. I got nothing but trash around me and I'm failing at all this other stuff. I don't want it this way. I don't like it this way, but I rely upon you and where have you got me? Nowhere, let alone heaven. And, and I'm in trouble. And yes, I'm going outside of your counsel. That's what's fundamentally happening when somebody is beginning to step out in faith. Going out, not knowing where you're going. They can't help. And this is where, that, that, that isn't just the day you come to Christ. It continues in many ways. It's something there that is always kind of repeating in different dimensions. You know, you can be a Christian and yet at the same time, and you can love the Lord and then all of a sudden something happens. Maybe COVID comes and you lose your job. You lose your job. Company goes broke. You're out of work. And all of a sudden, you're sitting there, wait a minute, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what to do. And, and once again, you're out, you, you don't, you're by faith now, not knowing where you're going, but okay, Lord, I've got it. You know, it may be your health. Your health is getting worse. You're going down. You're falling apart. You're getting older. I see enough gray hairs here. You know, you know what I'm talking about. You can't hear me, but you know but in, <laughs> what I'm talking about, if you could hear me. But the thing is, is that, you know, maybe you're young. You're just falling in love. You want to get married. You, you know, you got this handsome young buccaneer who he doesn't have anything, doesn't know who he is, where he's going, what he's doing, but he's, oh, follow me. You'll be my wife. And you're all excited. You go home to your dad. He says, that guy's an idiot. He doesn't know who he is, doesn't know where he's going. What do you think you're doing following him? I don't know. Where are you going to go? How are you going to I don't know. You go up, well, let, get that guy in here. I want to ask, where are you going? You want my daughter? You want to marry my daughter? What do you think you're doing? Yeah, well, how, how are you going to provide for I don't know. God's going to provide. Well, you, where, you got a job? No, not yet, but God will provide. 
Well, you're gonna, how are you going to pay the rent? I don't know, but God will provide. You know, and, and, and you, where, you don't know where you're going to live, how are you going to pay the rent, and you don't have a job, but God's going to provide. Yes. The guy goes to his wife, and he says, how the conversation going? He says, I don't know, but the, kids think, the kid thinks I'm God, obviously. <laughs> you know, so somebody, my parents, going to get me through. No. But where somebody there in your life, believe God has these times. They're ordained of him. And they repeat is that, that our faith would grow, that it would be something there. We think we're going to meet these guys in heaven, you know, and, and, and we will. And these wonderful, the, you know, Naomi's and the Ruth's and the Hannah's and these wonderful men and women of faith in their life. But all of them, you won't find me one that you respect and you think highly of that didn't have many of these issues where they had to trust God, not knowing where they were going. And many of you right now, you're in, in that process. There's things going on now. Things may be fine. You got a good job. Your health is fine. Your home, marriage, family, kids, your grandkids, your great grandkids, and everything else is great. And you even believe that right now the economy is good. God bless you. <laughs> You're crazy, but God bless you. You're happy. Well, I don't want to disturb it. No, I'm just kidding there. But I mean, I'm just saying that we that there's many times in life where we don't know where we're going, and this is what God, God you know, what God wants to do. And to teach us there. And Abraham, as he begins to go out, in these natural senses, where are you going? He didn't know. And you know, the interesting thing is, is that as this happens, it's going, you know, when, when, when we go out, that's how it begins. And you'll go through that again and again. But, it's, there's the, but that's just the stage one. That's just first step in faith. The next step Abraham had to go through in Hebrews 11, verse 14. It says, for they that say such things, they declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they'd been mindful of the country from which they came out, they might have had opportunity to return. All right, the God comes to Abraham. I've got an inheritance for you. It's an incredible one. You're going to Abraham, look north, south, east, and west. Everywhere you can see, I'll give it to you if you, if you follow me. Okay, I like that, I'll go. And uh, Abraham, uh, how many children do you have? I don't have any. Well, don't worry about it. Abraham, if you'll follow me, you can look to the stars of the sky and the sands of the sea. So shall thy descendants be. I'll give you kids. Really? Oh, I'm in. He didn't know God. This is just, he's, he's told this pie in the sky, incredible things. But, but there it was enough that he declared plainly. He stepped out in faith. He went. Uh, there and, 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 as, and as he stepped out, he, that was a plain declaration, the Bible says, that he's seeking another world. But it wasn't until he was willing to step out. And when they now step out, they have now declared that they seek a country. And truly, the next verse says, though, and he says, also, though, please understand this, that if they had at every time been mindful of the country from which they came out from, they might have had opportunity to return. In other words, God says, by the way, Abraham, you, had a, you step out in faith, uh, here's the blessing. But I also want to tell you that if you ever want to go back, you can go back. You can go back. I, I don't lock the door. I, I, I don't slam it behind. If you're mindful of the country, you can't stop thinking about what you once had and what it was once like, and now you're looking at how it is, and you realize, <laughs> I, was, I, I don't know. Well, if you want to ever go back, if you're mindful of it, what you came out, you have opportunity to return. I will never take that away. And the interesting thing is, is it's one thing to go out in faith, but it's an entirely different process and trial and difficulty, you might say, in staying out in faith. The going is always exciting. The going is always kind of a, you know, of a, of a, of a wonderful thing there kind of because we paint this whole world. Oh, I'm going to fall in love. Oh, it's wonderful. Oh, we're going to get this little white house with a little white picket fence in front of it and flowers and roses growing on it. We're going to have a swing set in the back for the kids in this. And we, there's something, when you, when you head out, there, there's something about us. You're going to go off and we always have this, this picture of what it's going to be that is oftentimes quite different from reality. And then here Abraham, that's what he did. He went out. But then he says, if you ever mind for the country in which you came, you ever feel like you know something? I, I might have been a mistake. That's Abraham. He finds himself. He went out. He obeyed. He went out not knowing whither he went. He did everything that God asked perfectly. But I'm sure you know the story. 
It tells us there when Abraham, by faith, in obedience, arrives in the promised land, which God told him to come, and now he's there. When he gets there, there's a famine in the land. A famine. And now Abraham is there looking, having to deal with a famine. What am I going to do with a famine? Abraham, by the way, he's incredibly wealthy. When Abraham decided to go out in faith, it was an incredible thing that he did. When you stop to think of this, this man had everything. He had everything in the world, you know, there going for him uh, when he went out. He was an extremely wealthy man. He's 75 years old when this process starts in his life. His wife was 65 at a place in life where no 75-year-old could dream of a world better than his. He had everything. He's believed to be one of the wealthiest men in the world at the time, maybe even history. We're told about Abraham. He was exceedingly wealthy in silver and gold and flocks. We're told about him there that uh, uh, in here when, when he heads out, one of the little indicators as to how wealthy he was was that we're told in Genesis 14, his nephew Lot is taken captive by some kings. And at the time, you, there was no police force or army. Hey, go get my nephew. If you had any wealth, you protected it yourself. You had to have your own police, your own army. There was, no, there was nothing else. That was the, there was no structure of society. And so here when his nephew Lot is taken captive by these kings, Abraham's got to go after him himself. But it tells us in Genesis 14, 14, that Abraham gathers together 318 of his own trained servants. He had his own private militia. This man was unbelievably wealthy, beyond comprehension to us. Ah, 318. That's just his, that's his own private army. That's let alone his domestic health. And by the they, they think that most expositors, Abraham probably had somewhere between 2,000 men and 2,500 mouths to feed three times a day. That with his entourage that went with him, an unbelievable journey. And at 75 years old, to pick up and leave. To walk away from everything in the world you got for it. You know, here, you know, maybe, you know, maybe the men, you know, if, uh, who knows? He had 50 servants and thought, you know, when I get 100, I'll be happy. No, maybe 200. No, 300 will do it. You know, when I get 1,000 acres. No, 2,000, 5,000, 10,000 acres. When I get uh, 1,000 head of sheep, 2,000 head of cattle. When I get 5,000, when I get 10, no matter what it was. Unbelievable amount of wealth, but there was still something missing. Still something at 75, he's looking over, is this it? Is this it? And finally there at that time, the Lord breaks. So he says, no, it isn't. Abraham, I've got another room. And there the one thing that Abraham had him going for him was the fact that in spite of all that he had, he had a desire for God. He realized there that voice that was speaking to it was real. So much so he was willing to walk away from all of this to venture out, to take a step of faith, not knowing whether he went, but when he actually arrives, there in this great step of faith, in this great thing, packs them all up, takes this unbelievable entourage, and he gets to the promised land, and where is he? There's a famine. There's a famine. You didn't tell me there was a famine? What's going on here? I mean, now all of a sudden it's not going out in faith. The excitement of that is gone. Now the reality there of trying to stay out in faith. He's looking at this thing and figuring, I don't know how to do this. And there, but at the same time, he, he realized, well, wait a minute, I guess I do know. I'm a, a, after all, nobody gets to be as successful I am as not being brilliant and very smart and work their way through a lot of tough times. I have to, it looks like I've got to help God out. I don't know if I'm ahead of schedule. I don't know what he missed up. I don't know what went wrong. But obviously there's some failure and breakdown here that needs my assistance. And so Abraham, the Bible tells us, he realizes there that there's no famine down in Egypt. And everything he needs is down in Egypt. And he's a very wealthy man. I'll go down there and negotiate and trade and deal, you know, with everything to get us through the famine. So Abraham decides God needs my help. And so he goes back to the natural senses. He goes back to them. He didn't go back to Ur of Chaldees. You've got to give him that credit, but he, but he did go to Egypt. And then even not, when now he's on his way, you know that story too. I'm so, you know, he looks at Sarah one day and says, well, you're very pretty. She says, well, you haven't said that in a while. He says, well, right now, honey, I'm sorry, but it's a problem. Really, why? Well, we're going down to Egypt, and the amount of business we'll do down there is going to be enormous, a lot. 
and uh, we'll probably meet Pharaoh. Now, these Pharaoh, they think they're gods. If they see something, they just take it. It's theirs. And if it's a woman, they just take the woman. And if it's a married woman, bye-bye husband. Now, we wouldn't want that, would we, honey? You know, he said, but don't worry about it. I'm, I'm, you know me, I'm brilliant. I've worked my way through a lot of stuff. There's going to be a problem, you know, probably planning, you know, plan for worst case scenarios. I'm all ready for it. Uh, we'll probably meet Pharaoh, and if we do, and then Pharaoh does take an interest in you, here's what we're going to tell him. We're going to tell him that you are my sister, that it may be well for thee and me, mostly me. But anyway, so here, you are like God, who, God, God has a wonderful sense of humor. You got to realize the Lord, he's got a great sense of humor. Uh, and he says, you know something, Abraham, you are brilliant. You are. Let's go with your plan. Let's go with your plan. Let's see how it works out. So sure enough, they get down there. They do meet Pharaoh. Pharaoh does take an interest in her, does inquire about her. Oh, that's a beautiful woman. Oh, yeah, it's my sister. Yeah. Oh, you're sitting. Yeah, I yeah, asked Well, wow, I, I like her. But I'll tell you, Abraham, you're a really smart guy. I'm a smart guy, too. You got yourself in a problem right now. You need stuff. You came to the right guy. I got boatloads. I got everything you need. Everything. Oh, I can, and I'll give it to you. You can have it. You don't have to pay me for it. I'll give it to you. You can just take it. And, but in exchange, I'll take your sister off your hands. And she can be mine. What do you say, bro? <laughs> and Abraham, you know, the Abraham, probably like a deer in headlights, uh, okay, he does the deal. He does the deal. You can watch Sarah, watch this thing go down. And all of a sudden, well, honey, I'll, uh, uh, sis, sis, I'll, uh, don't worry. I, 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 things are going to be fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pharaoh goes to take her to himself. God intervenes. Not in Abraham's faith at this point, probably Sarah's. But God intervenes, and he tells Pharaoh, Pharaoh, you, you can't have the woman. Beg your pardon? No, you can't have her. What do you mean I can't have her? I'm Pharaoh. You, you can't have her. Do you realize what that woman cost? She was really expensive. And the Lord says, they're all expensive, buddy. They're all expensive. <laughs> it's in the Hebrew. Just take my word for it, okay? It's there. All right, it's not. But anyway, but the rest of it is. God, and he says, you know, and he says that's that man's wife. He's got a lion problem. We got to work on that. We give him his wife back and send him home. And here, so Abraham, with his tail between his legs, and a humbling experience. And haven't we all had those? How many times have we stepped in and helped God out? How many times in our life we've stepped out in our journey of faith and we've gone down and somehow or another God didn't know what he was doing? And if he'd have listened to us, we wouldn't have had a problem. And so we just took over, and then next thing you know, we got a big one. It's happened to all of us. It, 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 I'm not me. I, I've read books about it, though. You know. All right, it's me. But anyway, the thing is, is that when our, when when we have that journey, here Abraham, that you know, I I I, I don't know if it, they'll have videos in heaven. It'd be interesting. I'd love to see the trip home with Abraham and Sarah. He's sitting around the campfire at night. <laughs> Probably would be a silent movie, but it'd be interesting to watch the, the watch it. But anyway, in the journey of faith, there, whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. He puts us through these things. Now get back to it, Abraham. And here, though, it's one thing to go out in faith, but it's a whole other thing to stay out in faith. You see, because when we go out, there's this excitement. We paint the picture, the picket fence, the house, the kids, all this. You know, but it's something there. I mean, it's always exciting, exciting falling in love. It's so all of us. You get married, boy, that's the woman. Oh, please, God. I mean, I ask her to marry me. You'll blind her eyes. Don't let her understand. Just have her say yes or whatever. I just love, I got to have the woman. Please, Lord. And, you know, and how exciting it is falling in love. Maybe, you know, you have a home. Maybe you remember if you bought a home, your first home, but you remember, oh, Lord, I can't afford it, but the bank, you can talk to the bank, blind their eyes, have them give us the loan. We, we can hardly pay, you know, but, you know, we're going to give this off our lowball, but, hey, please, God. And the next thing you know, they take the lowball off, and the bank comes through and says, we'll loan it to you, and the next thing you know, you got the house. Remember how excited you were? We got the house. You came in, you danced around the place. We got the house. This is wonderful. 
You know, maybe the, your, your first job. You went and interviewed that meant there's 50 people that want the job. Oh, man, but it goes down to 40. You're still in 30. You're still in 20. You're, in. you're praying like crazy. God, give me the job. It's just designed for me. I'm the person. You know, it comes down to five, and then the next thing you know, they call you in. You got the job. Oh, I can't believe it. I got the job. How excited you were. Or your first child. Hey, your first call, oh, God, the child. I'm a parent. I'm a bona fide creator of human beings. You know, there. This is. Oh, Lord, thank you so much. We're going out. So exciting. That's so wonderful. But then at the same time, they, these children, they have a way of becoming teenagers. And the next thing you know, you're sitting there now. Just saying, kill me now, Lord. Just finish me off. I can't take this anymore. You know, or that, that job, that job that was so exciting, you couldn't believe you got it. You never even wondered why the cubicle was empty. Why did I get the job? I don't know. Well, you get the job and you find out. The company's bankrupt. They didn't pay anybody. And now it's your job. You got no job. You're working like crazy. Oh, we're going to pay you. We're going to pay you. Don't worry about it. And all of a sudden you realize there is no job. And you're so excited. Or that house. You were so excited. We got the house. I wonder why they were selling it. I don't know. I'll tell you why they sold it. The roof leaked. The foundation was falling apart. The electrical was gone. The plumbing was gone. And now it's your house. How excited we all were when we get something. Or that woman that we've... No, let's not go there. But the, uh, the thing... All of these things, there, we, we go out in faith. But then the issue now of staying out. Now there we're looking at it and there's a whole world that says this isn't what you bargained for. This is not what you expected in a home or a marriage or a family. Just face it. It didn't happen. You wanted it to happen. You hoped it was happening. You tried to do whatever else it was. It's gone belly up. Look at this family. You don't need any of this stuff. There's something to tell you. You don't need to stay out. Just cut your losses and move on. And now you're sitting there. You've got all these things inside and there's a famine. And there's one voice behind that says, stay. And you'll find something in me you never knew existed. Trust me. Now you've gone out in faith. Now stay out in faith. I'll transform this. I'll do a work way beyond you. Seems hopeless to you. Seems like a giant you can't conquer. But there when there's something there that you go out, and then the next challenge that there is is staying out in faith. You can go back. You're mindful of it. You can go. You're going to do it. You'll regret it. Hebrews 11:17. By faith, Abraham, when he was offered, when he was tried, tested again, when he was tested and tried, he offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Now this one, this is a tough one. This is a tough one. I think we all get going out in faith. You don't know, that's not rocket science. We get that. Staying out in faith, I think that's, that's not difficult. But now, God comes to Abraham and he says, Abraham, this is 50 years into it. Abraham, uh, hey, hi, Lord, how you doing? Yes, great. Abraham, uh, I want to talk to you about something. Oh, anything. What is it? Isaac, I want to talk to you about Isaac. Oh, yeah. What a kid. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. So what about Isaac? Well, uh, Abraham, I want you to uh, offer Isaac to me. Uh, beg your pardon? Yeah, you got it. You got it right, Abraham. I'm like Isaac. I thought that's what you said. Yeah. Now, we look there, like I say, we get going out in faith and staying out in faith, but now, here God is asking him to offer up everything. Everything. You see, you realize there that when God came to Abraham, he told him there years ago, if you'll follow me, I got an inheritance. Look north, south, east, and west. That is all yours and your descendants. Look to the stars in the sky, the sands, the sea, the children innumerable that will come from your loins. 
innumerable, if you'll follow me. And he looks there, whoever blesses you, I will bless them. Whoever curses you, I'll curse them. You trust me, I will stand with you. And if anybody that comes against you, they'll regret it. And then he says, I got another one. What's that? Out of your loins, the Messiah will come of the world. Wow. I'm in. Now realize, he, Abraham didn't know the Lord. He just rumored, like with me when I came to Christ. I didn't know who he was. I'm just offered heaven, forgiveness of sins, life, the new journey, God's help, God's blessing. I go to heaven and my sins. I mean, all of this. What a package. I'd heard of him by all the rumors, but I, who, who wouldn't to me? I'm in. But the thing is, is that here Abraham, God knew Abraham, you know, he knew he baited him. He knew, I'll give you this, I'll give you this, I'll give you this, I'll give you this. And he's looking at me, you got to be kidding me. No, I'm not kidding. I don't kid. I'm God. Okay. I'm in. I know who you are, but I'm in. Well, after 50 years, they knew who each other was. They knew when God had saved him and helped him and led him and cared for him, day, day, you know, year in, decade in, decade out. And here's a question that God, I believe, as I said, wants to ask everybody. Everybody, not just Abraham. But it's a very, very simple question. It is not a hard to, a question to understand, I think. It may be on the surface, but basically it was a very simple question. It's like he's looking at Abraham and saying, Abraham, I want you to understand, I would never ask you this question when I met you. You didn't know me. I wouldn't ask you a year or two or five. You still didn't know much of me. I wouldn't ask you 10 or 20 years. You still didn't know me. Maybe 40, now or 50 I hope we've got enough of a history that I have the right to ask you a question that I've always wanted to ask. And I want to ask every one of my followers forever if I have the opportunity. What's the question? It's very simple. Because you see, all of those promises were wrapped up in Isaac. No Isaac, no more promise. No land, no descendants, no Messiah, no enemies conquered. Every bit of it. Now it's all gone. But here God asks him a question. And to me it's very simple. Abraham, I'd like to ask you, am I more precious to you than anything I've ever given you? Very simple question. Very simple question. Not hard to understand. Particularly, I've been married 55 years. Now, I can tell you without question, when I met Jean, it didn't take me long to fall in love. I'm sitting there realizing this is the most incredible package I've ever seen. First of all, she was beautiful. And then she was a beautiful person. She loved the Lord. She had an incredible personality. She was happy. She wanted to serve the Lord. You could just bullet point after point. Check, 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 check. I got to get that woman. I don't know, I'll beg, steal, lie, whatever it is. I want that woman. Well, it worked. I got her. And next thing you know, I mean, all these goods, I mean, all this blessing, all of this, boy, this is all right. This is working out. She's incredible. And yet, at the same time, here was something, basically, it was all what I was getting out of it, if we're honest. But I can believe, honestly, tell you, after 55 years, I can honestly look at her and she to me. And I can say I love you more than anywhere we've ever been, than anything we've ever done, and anything we have. You've become that to me. And that's what love is. God was wanting to look at Abraham. Abraham, do, do you love my, the hand more than you love than anything that came from the hand? And he would never ask that early on with somebody. But it's a question he longs to ask. When somebody says, I'll die for you, I'll offer you all my life, everything, anything, I don't care what it is. You've taken everything over. And here the wonderful thing is, is that Abraham, when God asked him, he said yes. No question apparently about it. Nothing going on. But here is Abraham. What had happened is all these other senses that told him one thing, he had grown to the others. That he trusted God fully. Fully. 
And you know, it's one thing, you know, to, I'm going to close here in a moment, but some of you right now, you're just at a place in your life where God's just asking you to go out, not knowing where you're going. It takes all the faith in the world to do that. That's where Abraham started. Some of you are there. Maybe some of you, you're going through issues in your career or health or whatever else, where to, you, God's saying, go out, trust me. Trust me. Go out not knowing where you're going. It happens repeatedly. Some of you might be right there now. Others of you, maybe some of you, you know, I, I, I'm out. I'm good. But the stain is really hard. It may be the home, the marriage, the family, the kids, the job, the finances, all, all, all sorts of stuff. But just there were the stain out. And the voice says, you don't need this. And the challenge is, as the Lord is saying, yes, you do need this. I will be with you like I was with Abraham, like I was with David, like I was with Elijah, and I was with Moses. Trust me. And you realize that's what God's saying to you. And others of you, you're, you're there. You're out. You stayed out. But now things are going away. Now the life is deteriorating. You're getting old. You're falling apart. Your life is fading. You're losing loved ones. Some of you are sitting here alone. Your mate's gone on the heaven. You're going down. I know that. I, I, 1996, I had a stroke, lost the functional vision in my right eye. That was just the beginning. Next thing I know, things go on. I, was, I, I wanted to be an athlete in college. I never was. I tried. I just, all I did was break stuff up. But I had to have a hip replaced. Then I had to have another hip replaced. And a few years ago, I had to have both of my knees replaced. Then through the years, I lost a lung. And then they had to replace my right shoulder, and then it didn't work. They had to tear it out and put in a new one. And then, uh, and then, I, I, I've, then the doctors, I'm sitting here with back pain like I've never known in my life before. But I, the doctor said, are you back? Is you, have you seen your back? And he shows it to me. I said, that's my back. He said, yeah, you got scoliosis. And you got stenosis because that's not lower, all your bulging discs, and you got deteriorating in the spine. I'm three inches shorter than I was in college. I'm going down, literally. That guy's going down. He is going down fast. But you're going. You're getting old. You're falling apart. I'm coming on 80. I don't know if I'm going to make it. But you sit there, all right, Lord. If, I don't care what you want. You can have whatever you want. I trust you. That's what he wants. You know, you cannot determine a lot that happens in your life, but you can determine how you're going to handle it. And I see so many people that they get old and they're angry and they're bitter, you know, and look at me. I can't see, I can't hear. All these senses are going. I can't smell, I can't touch. I sit here in a wheelchair and I can, they wheel me around and I feed me with a spoon, you know, and look at me. I, and they're, and, and they, they, these are all deteriorating and they never got these. Who wouldn't be angry and bitter and nasty? But if somebody can say, God, you can take anything and everything, just replace it with you. Something of you. And I'll trade you in a heartbeat. And today, some of you, the Lord is saying, you're going down. But you can decide how you're going. And you can say, I want my kids and my grandkids. I've got five great-grandchildren. I want them all to see me go down and say, I want to go like Grandpa. I want to go like him.